السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الجلسة الحالية قبل أن أتحدث عنها وهي عن دور الإعلام في النهوض بالمعرفة والسلم والإنصاف أود أن أسجل اعتراضي على مصادرة حرية الرأي والتعبير في القاعة جاست جوك يعني أنه صدروا الـ الـ الاستراحة القصيرة فلا أدري إذا كان هناك من يشاطرني هذا الرأي أم لا لكن أرى أنه بعض المقاعد فاضية يبدو أن البعض ذهب لأخذ استراحة دور الإعلام في النهوض بالمعرفة والسلم والإنصاف أساسي جدا المجتمعات التي لا يوجد فيها إعلام مسؤول وحر لا تتقدم الحرية خصوصا حرية الإعلام هي شرط أساسي لنماء المجتمعات ولنهوضها وتقدمها كلنا نعرف ما لخطاب الكراهية من مساوئ ومخاطر على المجتمعات وخطاب الكراهية يكون ينبع من مجانبة المعايير المهنية في الأداء الإعلامي أو في المؤسسات الإعلامية عندما لا يكون الصحفي متبع لمعايير مهنية عندما لا يكون الصحفي محايد ومسؤول ويسعى لنقل الحقيقة كما هي تتضرر المجتمعات إلى حد كبير وكلنا نعرف أمثلة كثيرة منها المثال بعض الحروب الأهلية مثلا رواندا وما كان للإعلام من دور في إذكاء الصراعات بين مكونات المجتمع وغيرها حتى الآن بعض المجتمعات العربية تكتوي بنار الإعلام الذي لا, لا نستطيع أن نقول غير مسؤول وإنما أيضا يفتقر للآليات التي ينبغي أن يعمل بها فالصحفي أحيانا لا يحصل على التكوين الكافي الصحفي أحيانا لا يفرق بين ما هو مهني وما هو غير مهني ومن أمثلة ذلك بعض البلدان العربية التي تعيش صراعات الآن فنرى الكثير من التخلف وخطاب الكراهية إلى ما إلى ذلك عن دور الإعلام في النهوض بالمعرفة والسلم والإنصاف سيحدثنا اليوم الأستاذ جان جان من رئيس مجلس المعهد الدولي للصحافة الأستاذ توملو نائب مدير شبكة الصحافة الأخلاقية الأستاذ إيريك جنجي مدير مبادرة الإعلام الإفريقي الأستاذ الصادق شريق نقيب صحفيين سودانيين والأستاذ أميش كادم فالأدعو بدون إطالة أدعو الأستاذ شان من المعهد الدولي للصحافة ليتفضل بمداخلتي مشكورا Thank you very much it's, uh, it's great to be in Khartoum and um, I appreciate the invitation coming from um, Al Jazeera, the uh, Sudan Sudanese Union of Journalists, uh, the United Nations, and, um, and others who are involved in uh, this great effort uh, to um, uh, not only to train Sudanese journalists, but also uh, to talk to you about uh, journalism and uh, what's being done in terms of, as we said about the theme, the media's role in advancing peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the International Press Institute, which is based in Vienna, Austria. And as you have heard from Hassan uh, several times, going the organization it was started in 1953 in New York. And uh, after being based in New York for several years, it moved to London. And it was started by a number of newspaper editors from around the world uh, because there was a need uh, to work on free press issues, uh, not just in the US, not just in Europe, uh, but uh, all around the world. And we're very much dedicated to that. 
back in 1971, we moved from uh, London to Vienna, Austria. And uh, IPI has been uh, based in Austria uh, ever since. And we have 21 national committees uh, all over the world uh, in which we, it, it's, the organization is unique in that it's made up of a number of journalists. We have members, leading journalists, editors, publishers, uh, media owners, and uh, we recently changed our constitution uh, to now allow um, uh, journalists, uh, you don't necess necessarily, necessarily have to be a leading journalist uh, to be a member of, um, of IPI. IPI, uh, once a year, holds uh, what we call a World Congress, in which we bring journalists from around the world uh, to various countries for our meeting. Um, a few years ago, we met in, um, in, uh, in Myanmar, and that's the meeting that you attended. You were telling me you were at the meeting in, in Myanmar, and um, this year we're meeting next week in Hamburg, Germany. And I would like to invite all of you to join us in Hamburg if you can. The meeting will be from the 18th to the 20th, and uh, we'll be discussing a number of issues, including the future of journalism. And so you'll find a number of discussion points coming out of, of Hamburg that, um, that will help you and, uh, and interest you uh, as you work through some of the issues uh, that we heard about this morning here in, um, in Sudan. Now, uh, as the executive board chairman of IPI, I have been fortunate over the last two years to travel all around the world talking to journalists uh, in some countries that are in conflict and some countries that are not. And as I listened to the discussion this morning, I want to sort of um, bring up or point out three examples uh, that I think might be instructive as you think about where Sudan goes as it relates uh, to free press and uh, freedom uh, ultimately of expression. Uh, last year uh, in Zambia, uh, a few, uh, about three weeks, three weeks to four weeks before the election, very pivotal presidential elections in Zambia, the president decided to shut down the one opposition publication. Um, and what it meant, for the most part, is that as the election campaign continued, there was no outlet for Zambians to get access to the other side. So most of the Information coming to Zambians was information that the government wanted people to have about the election. And uh, with the help of Eric Chinje and his team, we went into Zambia to talk to uh, journalists on the ground. We talked to opposition leaders, and we talked to uh, members of the government, as well as uh, members of the diplomatic community about uh, what was happening and how we can work with them to get uh, the opposition newspaper uh, reopened. But something remarkable happened in Zambia. The, the members of the newspaper that was closed, instead of not publishing and, uh, and going about their business, they decided to set up a mobile newsroom outside the gates of uh, the closed newspaper. And every day that newspaper was published, people would come from all around to pick up this, this newspaper. So the government tried to shut it down, but the people kept it open. So that's, that's something to keep in mind when you think of um, you know, where we go here in Sudan. Another example. Uh, Last year, I happened to have been in the Middle East, and um, 
we heard about another crackdown on the press in Turkey. Among the people that was arrested was a board member of the International Press Institute, one of our colleagues. He was uh, a columnist for Umhuriyet, um, and the government thought that uh, the newspaper, as, as we later found out, uh, according to the government, uh, was um, advocating terrorism in, uh, in Turkey. Of course, this is a newspaper that had been writing against the people that the government thought that it was, uh, in, um, in, it was aligned with. So I happened to have been not very far from Turkey. I went to Istanbul, went to the newspaper offices, talked to the journalists there, went to the home of uh, our, our fellow our colleague who, who was arrested, spoke to his wife and his son. And one of the things that, that I learned coming out of that, that uh, outside of that paper every day after the arrest, uh, journalists not just from that newspaper, but journalists from throughout Istanbul would come and protest, and I think they're still doing that today, even though this was six months ago, uh, would come and protest against the government's decision. Um, un unfortunately, as I said, the government had, had arrested all of the leaders of the newspaper. The, the newspaper continues to publish, but uh, they were sure of one thing, that um, although the government sought uh, to, uh, to pre prevent them from publishing, they were committed to keeping the newspaper going, keep it, keep it open. So um, it, it was great and, and, and really empowering for, for me to be there, even though I was there to support the journalists, to see them uh, being as strong and as effective as they were in, in, getting, uh, in continuing to get the message out. Now, the third example I was thinking about as I was listening to the conversation earlier today was uh, this, this, the, the, what happened in, in Doha, Qatar with Al Jazeera. Uh, I happened to have been at the at, uh, Al Jazeera anniversary uh, a few months ago in which the father emir talked about uh, the founding of Al Jazeera and why it was so important to help bring that light around, uh, not just around the Middle East, but now around the world. You guys remember that not uh, too long ago, um, Al Jazeera was being shunned in the United States, it was being sh shunned in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, at least during the Obama administration, I'm not quite sure that's the case now, but you can find Al Jazeera playing in the White House. Um, so Al Jazeera has come a long way, it's been accepted. And, um, and thanks to Al Jazeera, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of people around the world are getting um, real unbiased news about what's happening uh, in, their, um, in, their various, in their various countries. So as you think about where, where Sudan is going to go, uh, you think of uh, which example that you want to follow, and I would, may, may I suggest that you follow the, the example of what the, the father Emir did in Qatar by starting uh, Al Jazeera. And, and, and pretty much the, 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 the leadership in Qatar has, has left Al Jazeera to do what it, uh, the journalism that it wants to do without interference. And um, it was good to find out here in uh, Sudan about some of the changes that are taking place or that have taken place legislatively. And, um, and I hope that uh, uh, in, in, in the weeks, months, and years ahead that uh, uh, Sudan can be a model for freedom of information, freedom of expression, and if, if the International Press Institute can be helpful in any way in helping that to happen, we stand ready and we are uh, at your service. Thank you very much. Shukran Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. شكرا جزيلا من النقاط الأساسية أيضا في الجلسة ما دور الإعلام في نشر الوعي بمعايير وضمانات حقوق الإنسان والقانون الدولي الإنساني وكفالة احترامها 
ما هو الإطار المعياري والأخلاقي والقانوني الذي يقوم عليه دور الإعلام في مناهضة الدعوة إلى الكراهية القومية أو العنصرية أو الدينية التي تشكل تحريضاً على التمييز أو العداوة أو العنف كيف يمكن الاستفادة من التجارب الإعلامية الناجحة لكفالة احترام ضمانات حرية الرأي والتعبير ومناهضة الدعوة إلى الكراهية التي تشكل تحريضاً على التمييز أو العداء أو العنف ما الأسس القانونية الملزمة لوسائل الإعلام لبناء السلم الاجتماعي والإنصاف والمعرفة الشاملة وهل تقوم المؤسسات الوطنية المعنية بتنظيم, بتنظيم ممارسة حرية الصحافة وفقاً للدستور والمعاهدات الدولية المصادق عليها؟ هذه بقية النقاط التي سيجيب عليها المحاضرون في الجلسة الآن أدعو الأستاذ إيريك شنجي مدير مبادرة الإعلام الإفريقي للتحدث You have 10 minutes, sir Hello, uh, good morning everyone and uh, for some reason I didn't have my earphone on so I didn't get most of what you said but I, I think we had discussed it prior to my coming here um, I want to start off by thanking uh, I want to first of all thank <clears throat> Al Jazeera and the um, General Union of Sudanese Journalists for getting me here and for allowing me to come to Khartoum for the first time in maybe 15 years. I've seen a few changes in the, in the country, um, if not as much as I, I'd hoped to see, but there's some. This building is one of them. Um, and um, I come with greetings from the African Media Initiative, which is this organization uh, in, that I lead in um, Nairobi. It's based in Nairobi, but it's an Africa-wide organization, and I believe some of our friends from the uh, General Union of um, Sudanese Journalists have had interaction with uh, my organization. We engage in virtually all of the issues that we're discussing uh, in this forum. So I, what I want to do is to bring the experience from other parts of the continent that we spend so much time every day looking at, including Sudan. And um, the reason we do these things is so that our colleagues and friends in civil society, in the media, in uh, human rights organizations can draw from the other experiences and hopefully improve their game in country. I followed with a lot of interest the discussion of this morning, especially after Dr. Swag talked about this classification. And there was a lot of concern. And I was happy that there was a lot of concern. It shows that you're not happy with that classification. What I was afraid of was, you know, the fact that you were focusing too much on the position number 174 or number 170 or what is in. Look, if you're not number one, number two, number three, you should be concerned. The objective of everything should be, should be to take the country to number one. And we all can be number one, but we are not. And the question we should have is, why not? Why not? There is a relationship between good journalism, good journalism, and good governance in those countries that are at the top of the classification. There's a direct relationship. So in a sense, 
we should all be working towards being number one. And I hope someday there'll be 170 number one countries. I hope someday the 54 countries in Africa will all rise to being the top 10 or the top 15 or the top 54. And we can do that by addressing these issues. Let's, let me start off with hate speech. And the reason I mention hate speech is because it is one of, you know, it is one of the deeper problems we have on the continent of Africa. It's everywhere around the world, everywhere. But it's no reason for us in Africa to accept the fact that there is hate speech. And the tragedy of hate speech is that most journalists do not even know when they engage in it. We have, I come from a country, uh, Kenya, where I am. I'm, I'm not Kenyan, but that's where I am. I come from a country that is about to go into elections. And this is the this is the age of hate speech. This is the time when, when it takes on a whole new dimension. Because it feeds off the political tensions in the country. It feeds off, again, the quality of journalism in the country. When you have journalists who are very easily bought over, whether financially or for position or for a whole variety of reasons, they can easily, they, they easily find their own ideas influenced, not by a, a fair, a balanced appreciation of what is going on in the country. They are influenced by what some politician, some group, some political party, some business, some rich owner of a business. They're influenced by these people and these groups. And they allow that to compromise the quality of the content that they put on this, you know, in the media. Journalists who forget that they have one of the most powerful instruments for transforming society. They forget the beauty and the power of the role that is theirs. And when they do, Integrity gets thrown out the window. And what seeps in is what is tantamount to hate speech. Let me, I speak about Kenya because I, I know there are no Kenyans in the room, so I feel free to speak about Kenya, but you know. <laughs> um, we, what, what we've noticed is that some journalists focus on stereotypes about a tribe, stereotypes about a group of people, stereotypes about even a political party, stereotypes. And somehow they make fun of it, they make it sound light, but that plays into the minds of society as a whole and quite unconsciously they promote hate speech against that group, against the individual, against the village, that tribe or ethnic group, without knowing, or maybe sometimes knowingly. You know, there's another form of hate speech. And I, I know a lot of people will not like this. It comes when 
this emphasis between government media and private media is played up. Again, unconsciously, we find situations in just about every African country where the, the public media, that which is run by the government, is used to target different groups or, again, different individuals. And we, that language, the fact that you target a group, you want to expose things about them that is not just, not real, not correct, not ethical, Again, it's a form of, when you target individuals with the wrong messages, it's a form of engaging in hate speech, sometimes unconsciously. So again, we speak out against these things. I believe that given it's the importance of media, given the power of media, to transform society. I believe that it is incumbent, it is important for us, those who are in the media business, to not only understand that power, but to see the role they play as critical to the health of any society. If we don't see that, we downplay overplay or disregard the role that is ours. That is why <clears throat> I believe the argument today should never have been about where we stand in the classification of good or bad media. It should be about what we have to do, all of us on the African continent, all of us have to do to become number one. We have to deal with these issues, whether we like them or not. And we will do that when we understand the power of the instrument that we have control over. We will be able to do that when we understand the power of the media, the transformative power of the media. And we will understand it when we are prepared one of the problems we have is that the quality of journalists often leaves a lot to be desired. I read <coughs> reports about the things I do and say, because I, I travel around the continent and I speak. And when I read the reports about what I've said or done, I just, I don't, I never read it to the end. I just close, the, I throw the paper away. There's, this, there's a persistent inability amongst the journalists, not all, but many, to comprehend the forces that move our society, to comprehend the issues that they should be educating the public about. Even this whole question of hate speech, it is often because people don't understand what they're saying or doing. So, I speak to media leaders. It is important to try and train your journalists. It is important to expose them. It is important to bring them close to power. Let them engage with ministers and the president, if they can get to that, to understand why they do what they do. Let them engage with communities, with different groups in society to understand what they do. Help your journalists understand their societies. Otherwise, they will never be in a position to help those societies. And I say this because it is consi consistent. I see it across Africa. The poor quality of journalism also explains a lot of the problems that media on the continent continues to have. And it has to do with everything we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shukran jazeelan, Ustad Eric. 
وننتقل من موضوع أهمية المحتوى الإعلامي وتدريب الإعلاميين وخطاب الكراهية إلى المحور الموالي مع الأستاذ توم لو نائب مدير شبكة الصحافة الأخلاقية فليتفضل مشكورا Assalamu alaikum. It's very nice to be back in Khartoum after six years away. So thank you for the invitation from the Al Jazeera Center for Public Liberties and Human Rights. And thank you for the Union of Sunnis Journalists for, for hosting us. And thank you all for being here and everyone else who's been involved uh, in, in organizing this. Now, I'm very pleased that I'm following Eric immediately because uh, what I'd like to go into in a bit more detail as he was talking about hate speech is how do we define it, how do we explain it to other people and thirdly how do we make sure that our, our concerns about hate speech and our concerns about issues around fake news do not unduly impinge on freedom of expression and of the journalists' ability to do their job. So, I'm just waiting for the, the presentation to load. Aha. Shukran Hassan. And one of the reasons that I want to use the slides is that they are, some of them are half English, half Arabic. Nus, nus. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to, uh, to benefit from them. But if you don't understand English and the next generation don't understand English, you can blame me because I spent three years trying to teach English at universities in, in, in Sudan. So. I'll take my share of the blame if, if that is the case. Uh -huh. So what I want to talk about is how the ethics of journalism can be an inspiration for free expression. Uh, if you do tweet, these are my details, you can find us, so do, do go ahead. So who are we, first of all? So we are looking to strengthen the craft of journalism, which is very important, as Eric was just saying to promote higher ethical standards in media through education, training, and the publication of useful research. So to explain a bit about the background of the EJN, uh, we were founded by uh, Aidan White, who for 25 years was the General Secretary of the International Federation of Journalists. Now, while he was at the IFJ, he wrote this book, called To Tell You the Truth. And as you can see, it has been translated into Arabic. So if you're interested in these issues of standards and ethics, you can go to our website and you can download this for free. And I'm sure it'll be very useful for training in your newsrooms and at universities and, and other places. So please do look at this. And we're hoping to update this uh, this year with some more modern examples. So what have we been doing since we were founded four years ago? We were looking at self-regulation in places like Egypt, censorship in places like Turkey, uh, mistakes when made covering um, accusations of, of blasphemy, uh, how, again, the ethics of journalism can be an inspiration for media literacy projects, and when covering conflicts. And most recently, we published Ethics in the News. Uh, I have a couple of copies here. We actually, we had one chapter dedicated specifically to hate speech in Africa. So please, either come and ask me for a copy or find it on our website for more information about that. So at the EJN, the Ethical Jazz Network, we love defining things. So we agree on what we mean before we, before we move on. First of all, I want us to, uh, pro I want to propose these three things as uh, the principles for free thinking in a society. So truth and accuracy, 
fact-based communications, humanity, avoiding malice, accountability, transparency, and self-correction. And when I say accountability, I mean to your audience. I don't mean to your government. Journalism is accountable to their audience and to themselves and to their peers in whichever regulatory body they, they create for themselves and to your audience. If you make a mistake, you have to hold your hands up and say and apologize and correct that mistake. Often, us journalists, we are very bad at doing this and admitting where we're wrong. We like to think that we are always right, but we make mistakes, we have to own up. Now, recently, you might be aware of this phenomenon of, of fake news. And often, the issues of fake news and hate speech, they get mixed up together. People talk about fake news and, and, and hate speech. They're, they're distinct things. So our definition that we created for fake news is information deliberately fabricated and published with the intention to deceive and mislead others into believing falsehoods or doubting verifiable facts. It's the definition that we have created. Uh, so we can make it clear from hate speech and we can make it clear that journalism is not this. And we must make sure that when we are competing online with new media and elsewhere that the ethics of journalism is, a, a, is clear in what we publish. Because deceptive and unverified and error-filled reporting has always been with us, that doesn't make a, a journalist who makes a mistake fake news. It doesn't make an outlet who has published something in error fake news. But that is when we have to make sure that we are accountable. Now, the Ethical Journalism Network started working on hate speech in 2014 to mark the anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. And we launched the campaign in Rwanda. We're trying to mobilize journalism, uh, just, as, just as Eric was talking about, to become more aware of what hate speech is and to be able to communicate it to our audiences and to make sure that media do not unwittingly become a, a conduit for hate speech from leaders and from members of society. So then they make sure they report things in context. Now, just a quick talk about the international context of hate speech. Geneva Conventions and international policy related to torture and refugees and atrocity of crimes and the international agenda since 19, 1945. Um, but it lacks a clear definition in, in some cases. And so that's what I'm going to go into in, in just a second. As I said, hate speech can be a way of mobilizing public support for actions that threaten the lives of others, as in the case of Rwanda. Propaganda has always been an important strategy about making war. But people are entitled to free speech, as I just said. And even if something is offensive, rude, and hurtful, does not necessarily mean that it is hate speech. So what are the limits, and who draws the lines about this? So going on to our test, and here you can see, Nus Arabi, Nus English. So you can read it as well. Um, so, am I too close? Okay. One of the most important things about this is to take time when dealing with language which is sensitive. Don't rush to publish. So this test, which we developed, by international standards, following on from the Rabat plan of action on, on hate speech, um, is highlights the questions that you should ask yourself personally as a journalist and in newsrooms when dealing with language and who's saying it, who's saying it and why they're saying it. So the first test, the first question you ask yourself is the status of the speaker. So how might their position influence their motives of what they're saying? Should they even be ignored? Sometimes you see media report someone saying something very hateful which could incite violence, and the person is a nobody. So is it newsworthy? Does it pass the basic newsworthy test? This is the first question to ask. The second question is the reach of the speech. How far is it traveling? And is there a pattern of behavior in terms of what this person is trying to achieve? Then number three is the goals of the speech. So how does it benefit the speaker? The person who's saying this, are they saying this for self-interest? And are they deliberately trying to cause harm to others? This is very important. Are they deliberately trying to cause harm? 
The content itself, is it dangerous? Could it incite violence towards other people? And finally, and very importantly, the social, political, and economic climate of the speech. Who might be negatively affected? And is there a history of conflict and discrimination? So to summarize, don't sensationalize, avoid the rush to publish, and take a moment of reflection and ask yourself these five questions when you are considering publishing content which is uh, potentially hate speech. And once you've done that, you then start to think about in what context do I, do I report this speech? And if it is actually newsworthy at all, then consider um, whether or not it actually is newsworthy enough for your, your, your publication. So what I'd encourage you to do in your newsrooms as a, as a test, you can take this test from our website, download it for free, and you can take a piece of media from anywhere in the world and ask, does it meet these five pieces, th these, five, these five tests, these five questions, and have that debate. Um, so please, I encourage you, you to, to use it. So very briefly, what can we do to strengthen journalism, editorial independence, challenge intol intolerance, promote responsible communications, national and regional initiatives like the ones which Eric was talking about are very important, and to build respect for ethics and journalism in communications. So we believe that ethical journalism can be an inspiration for media literacy and for for free expression and responsible communications. And it's very important to add, again, on a definition, ethics and morals are different. Ethics are the personal choices which you make. Morals are what uh, society and, 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 and your, your, your surroundings will, will say to you is, is the way to behave. But your ethics is your personal choice as a journalist. So what I'm talking about today I'm not going to give you any answers about is this hate speech, is that hate speech, how should media in, in Sudan behave. All I'm trying to do is present some frameworks, some values, and some questions you can ask yourself when conducting your work. And hopefully that will help you to make better ethical decisions. Uh, so going back to the core ethics of journalism, which we have to bear in mind, are these five. Now, very just before I finish, I'll say that with our enthusiasm to address the issue of hate speech, which I have and which many of you here will have and which Eric was talking about, we have to be careful that in addressing hate speech, it does not have a, a bad effect on the freedom of expression. So we can't forget that people have the right to be biased. They have the right to be offensive. But hate speech is a, is a higher threshold. We have to be careful that, that, that we, have, we, are, we are careful about this. And there's a pattern which has been seen in many of the countries which we work in, and that is the deliberate taking of offense in order to censor someone else's opinion, to accuse someone of fake news and of hate speech in order for them to self-censor themselves. So we have to be very aware that when someone is making an accusation that someone is conducting hate speech in media or fake news, we have to be very careful and, and, and analyze that accusation to understand whether or not it is fair or not. So I'm going to leave you with some overall questions you might ask yourselves um, when dealing with, uh, when working in terms of ethics. So is there a danger of inflaming passions and incitement to violence? Is the speech fact-based and have the claims been tested? Have we avoided cliche and stereotypes, as Eric mentioned? Have we been temperate in our use of language? And when we use pictures, do they tell the story without violence and voyeurism? And are there diverse sources and minority voices? So these are some questions which you might want to consider. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. It's a pleasure to be back in Khartoum after all this time. Shukran jazeelan, Lestad Tomlo, Naib Mudir Shabakat Sahaba Al Akhlaqiyya. Uh, الآن مع الأستاذ أمش كادم من اللجنة الدولية للصليب الأحمر فليتفضل مشكوراً <تصفيق>